what's up everyone back to the podcast welcome back this is episode 204 uh last episode i talked about energize 21 this really good health challenge i was doing with friends and the test now this week um after we did three weeks this is week one of well technically week four but like yeah, I want to keep going. And I had a surgery on Tuesday. They took out the screws and the plate out of my foot. And um, I'm recovering pretty good, pretty well. But it is a constant thing to work on. Just trying to be more mindful of what I'm eating and what I'm putting into my body. So I appreciate having community and friends and that as a resource um, and to try to remember to use these people as a resource um, as well and to try not to be hard on myself if I, you know, stumble or get off, off the path. Um, I have talked a lot on here about my relationship to medication. Um, if you've been, some of you might be new and some of you maybe have been here for a while. So I could give you like a quick recap for, you know, both groups, but maybe especially to someone who's never listened, which is that. Yeah, since 2007, 8, um, I had an episode, 2007, didn't sleep for 30 days. It was like a month before I would turn 22. Then I, have, I had meds and I got through it and, you know, the mania turned into depression, but getting a quote unquote bipolar diagnosis from a doctor, that's what happened in that time. Long story short, I got off the meds and then I went right back to my life. Um, essentially, I just snapped out of it. Um, and looking back at my journey, that was really the only time I was able to snap out of it. And then when I had the second episode happen a year later, same symptoms, uh, racing thoughts, you know, couldn't sleep. I got put on Seroquel and I was over medicated with it and it was mixed in with some other medications. And I want to say uh, off to the races after that. And I tried to get off everything and I did um, about three years later from that time. And I ended up having the worst time of my life. And the very first story I tell on the podcast, very episode one is that story about how, what kind of happened at, you know, because I did that. But, um, the reason why there's a recap here is because everybody's treatment is, I would say a big thing I've learned with having these conversations is that people can have similar symptoms and similar experiences, um, but it's still individual to us and it still gets filtered through um, how we view the world, the people around us, like our background. It's It's not the importance of trying to hear people's stories, whether it's through a podcast or through a group um, or in the flesh to conversations with people. Yeah, there is the resistance of sharing in general, what we would call, you know, some kind of stigma and being vulnerable is risky, but being on meds as an experience to treat bipolar uh yeah i have to remind myself that 
I'm not the only one that's gone down this path, right? But in the last couple of years, um, well, I would go back further. In the last five years, since 2019, uh, the same year this podcast started, I had a, a hospitalization at Charter Oak Hospital. I was there for two weeks in August of 2019, and it was it was really rough. It was not sleeping, and what made it challenging was that I had had a previous episode at the beginning of that year, and I came out of it without any like med changes. So I was able to kind of just get back on track, same taking the same meds, which is um, a pretty relatively easy experience. But when this happened, you know, eight months later, uh, I had to get off the meds and change everything. And then that lasted a whole year and COVID happened and all this stuff. Right. So in the story that I've been living in, in my head for, 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 I mean, at least five years, it's possible that maybe these thoughts were there before, but I don't think as strong is, uh, you know, and sharing this right now, I'm thinking five years kind of sounds like a big chunk of time, <laughs> you know, like, um, it's not like, oh, I've been struggling with this for two weeks. The story I've been living in is that things have been hard, harder compared to, let's say, the five years before that. And sure, that's, you could say, is part of this journey where it's like, all right, maybe you have a... Uh, I don't know if good and bad are too general of words, but yeah, you have a good six months and then maybe you have a not so great six months and and someone could say if you're bipolar, is a, uh, if your diagnosis is bipolar, they could say, well, yeah, that's part of what you have. It's like you have a good week, then you have a not so great week and you're up and down, all these things, right? So I have equated five years of struggle to break it down more to be the reason for that is changing medications, getting off Seroquel, trying all these, these, these other things, which I did for a year, then getting back on it and then being, um, you know, over medicated and then slowly weaning off. And then I had an episode, which you guys know about. I didn't, uh, I did a podcast episode about being in an episode starting the end of July and, you know, feeling like August was kind of wobbly, but by the grace of God and with community and church support and, um, help from doctors and family, my support system was able to get through it fairly easily. Um, so the point is that this whole thing, podcast thing, and my life should be about giving hope to other people and not just about me sharing about me right but the purpose of me sharing about me should lead to helping others and i i don't think it always has um but that's what i want and that's what i want to keep putting in front of me and i think that that's a challenge too so take i, I want to take that challenge so i've told myself and let me know if you relate to this because I don't think I'm the only person that does this, that thinks this, but this is just, this is just the reality. The reality is our brain, our thoughts, 
um, are, are, you know, we are complicated people and what we think about um, over and over again, any kind of repetitive idea, thought, uh, sentence, belief. Um, we think so many thoughts a day, right? It was like 50,000 thoughts a day or something like that, right? That's a lot. <clears throat> There's no way you remember all of them. Um, and, you know, if you thought a bunch of stuff on Monday, it's highly likely that when you wake up Tuesday and you get your day going and you drink your coffee and you start running errands and you do what you do, that you're going to think about what you thought about the day before. And when you say it like that, um, that feels hard. That feels like a burden. Like, wow, really? I have to every day I have to redirect my mind to this different territory where I'm not obsessing over fill in the blank. And so worry, anxiety are forms of um, obsession. They can be where we just think the same thing and we worry and we obsess. And it, it's it, we don't know how to, um, I think, or we, we maybe we do, we don't know how to change that, how to like get out of that loop. And so the thoughts are, um, you know, it's basic CBT, right? The, the, the belief, the thought, and then like the behavior. So you, you think about it, then it makes you feel a certain way. And then you're acting on that feeling or like you, the, the feeling is after you act, but it's all starting with, I would say a group of thoughts. And then, um, you know, if you're sitting in a therapist chair, they probably would go, go deeper and say, okay, well, where do you think these thoughts come from? Are you, you know, and then we could go, uh, I don't really know. Right. And I think that's could be honest, but chances are uh, where these big ideas originate is, um, yes, your peers in school, uh, spirituality, religion, theology, church, stuff you hear, but it does go back to some kind of childhood experience um, where maybe these things were spoken to us over by our parents and our parents love us, but they're not perfect. And they could have been saying things that are untrue and lies about us that we didn't fully realize that, that that's what they were because we were kids and trying to survive and protect ourselves. So as we get older, there's an invitation if we want to take it to do the work and unpack that because it doesn't seem like things change very much um, unless we, we understand better this kind of design and this pattern where if we obsess over things, they do become a reality. And it can be a, a reality that we are like, oh, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to not believe in myself. I don't want low self-esteem because I'm telling myself that I'm not fill in the blank, worthy of love, worthy of a relationship, worthy of responsibility, worthy of leadership, worthy of um, a stable paying job like I don't just want to survive, but what's steering the ship is what I'm thinking, right? There's a scripture in James that says, like, the speech is, he's using an example of, like, the rudder of a ship. And if you get your speech in order, then everything else follows after that, right? And so... um Maybe that sounds like that goes against what I just said, but I would say that what you're saying is in line with what you're thinking. 
and it goes they they go to play off each other, right? So I had these hospital experiences, and then the story that's come out of them is, wow, everything's so hard. Like, why is everything so um, difficult, right? It's like hard to get out of bed. Um, you know, at the, the beginning of this time, I was doing the virtual tour job, but I was not really traveling. I was like in the office. I was driving around a lot back in the day doing... Um, the DoorDash and stuff. So the reason why I'm sharing this is because the thought that I have that seems to be uh, its own energy source <laughs> Um. You know, it's kind of like a ball of rubber bands. You know, it's like it's super small at first. I think there's somewhere where you can go where you can see like the world's biggest ball of rubber bands. And I feel like maybe when I used to travel, I saw this once. But it's like it just grows and grows and grows, this idea. So I've had this idea for, um, I mean, at least a couple of years now, maybe three years, where I keep saying that the reason why I'm struggling is because medicine that I'm on, that I've been on for 16 years now, I think November 2008 is when I got on Seroquel. So that is almost 16 years. I mean, next month. I mean, I'm going to be 39, so that is not half my life, but I mean, I have to do, I'm not great at math, guys. Um, that's like what 40 percent of my life you know or something like that all right somebody email me tell me how to do math the thought i have is like okay this point in the timeline of things in my life that i point back to this was a significant thing that in my opinion and maybe some opinions of people who are actual doctors would say yeah, man, you you are on a lot of meds. It's gotten weaned down to be less through all these different struggles. But if you read the label and you watch the commercial late at night or when you're at the gym, right, you see those like pharmaceutical commercials, you know, for Latuda or something. And it's like, here's all the side effects. But then, you know, you see a person that's sad because usually it's an antidepressant or something. And then um, maybe there's like an animation and then like there's clouds over them with rain. And then they see the doctor and they take this pill. And then seven weeks later, because it takes time for it to kick in, uh, now they're walking in sunshine and, you know what I mean? It's like an animation and then they're happy. <laughs> and then it goes... Uh, you know, like right before the commercial's over, oh, well, we got to tell you about the side effects. And uh, guess what? It's a really long list. It's not just one side effect. So <laughs> someone on some podcast, I think Michelle's podcast, she was on on uh, my show back in like April, May, uh, March, April. She had someone on who's like a, a psychiatrist researcher who was like, it's not really side effects. It's effects. Okay. And that does make sense because side effect sounds kind of temporary, right? It's like, okay, my foot hurts right now. I'm not, I, you know, I didn't ask for morphine. I don't need that, but I could take ibuprofen. And yeah, if I just take it today and then let's say I take it like four days from now, probably not a lot of side effects, right? Because so little of me, well, it's hard on your liver, but like, I'd have to be taking it every day, right? Now, most psych meds are, I mean, unless you get it in the form of a shot, uh, where maybe you can take a shot. Um, I only experienced this in the hospital. This never really was outside of the hospital. 
yeah, a shot is three months, six months, nine months. Right. You don't got to keep track of pills. You don't got to put a reminder on your phone. Right. For some people, it's like, oh, you got to take this twice a day, three times a day. Don't forget. Over time, it's effects. That's the point. And so the idea is I've had a lot of solo episodes where I've talked about this. You know, I talked about this on the, this Michelle episode because she was on meds, I think, seven years and she was able to get off of everything. And her point, which I agree with, is that. Um, and I get it. There can be a lot of real extreme views on it's, you know, all or nothing kind of approaches to medications like. You know, they do, they save lives and it's a chemical imbalance. And we, we go through such hard circumstances and, and things, episodes, suicidal thinking, mania, racing thoughts, delusions, psychosis, hallucinations, hearing voices that it's not like we can feel like the beginning of the journey of these things left us with no choice but to take the meds. But I honestly feel, um, and I've probably said this before, but I'm saying it again because I haven't really been doing very many episodes in the last four or five months. I feel stuck because the thought is back to what I was talking about with the CBT thing, right? The thought that is in my mind is I'm never really going to really get exponentially better unless I get off these meds. Like unless I find a way to not be so dependent on you know, this high dose of Seroquel that, you know, is the thing that is helping me go to sleep every night. Right. And is the thing that if I mess with it, you know, there's problems. Right. So the obsession and the thought there's just, there's no solution. It's just basically like, if, if I do this, things will be better. And so in the meantime, everyone around me uh, in any kind of friendship relationship is getting a version of me that is, uh, I guess without this sounding harsh, like a dumbed down version of Jared. And the confusion would be, well, not would be the confusion is that, um, people essentially love the version of me that's on meds. <laughs> right like think about that um because well a i mean yeah there's some people who've known me this whole time but that's that's a shorter list of people everyone who's in, in pretty involved in my life in the last decade i mean yeah they're not knowing me back and before i was like this and uh, or before medication there there those people are there's not a lot of, a lot of that you know outside of my family so it's a, it, 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 the stuckness is that, so A, I, I feel stuck, okay? B, part of, B, it's an excuse, okay? Because then it, the work, okay, which I think, you know, the work is not just, 12 step language, although I'm trying to do my Thursday night sexaholics anonymous meetings and struggling through it. Um, and, and celebrate recovery that I used to do. I, I'm, I, you know, the work, it's not just 12 step stuff. The work is, um, well, Nicola Perez book, how to do the work. She's a therapist and I've read some of it. And it's like her thing is, very trauma like childhood based and things that like we learn as a kid that we have to kind of unlearn or relearn as we get older it's an excuse to basically do any kind of work physical uh energized 21 kind of 
thing, right? Like, hey, man, I'm going to stop just eating whatever. I'm going to stop fast food. I'm going to stop sugar and my coffee and all these things and really think about what I'm eating and try to understand food, um, try to understand seed oils and the way things are cooked and uh, got to learn how to really cook at home or get, get, you know, all this, all this work just to not just be careless about the thing. So it, it there's a pattern, right? I feel stuck with this idea. Like if I, if I keep taking these meds, I'm going to keep feeling numb and kind of flat and things feel dull and I don't feel super present in the moment in a lot of situations with other people where I need to listen and I need to engage. It's just all this chaos in my mind and I'm not always expressing that to people. And then the grass is greener on the other side, but I'm, I'm on the side where the grass isn't green. So then, then I'm seeing myself as like, this isn't the best version of myself. And then when you're getting honest with that, you realize, okay, how long have I been having these thoughts? I think it's been at least a few years, right? It comes up in conversations with friends and for it to stay and be an excuse the excuse is to not do the work because you're you, what, what I'm saying. And let me know if you guys do this too. You're saying the meds keep me stable and I don't want to go through the chaos again and the darkness of maybe being suicidal or even maybe going to a hospital. Cause all of that stuff is um, there's a lot of trauma in hospitals and there's a lot of mixed a mixed bag of people that you'll see and you could get help but you also could it, it's there's a lot of factors right like i don't want to go back to a hospital i will if i have to um and by the grace of god i haven't been in four years but the point being to keep blaming things on bipolar and then saying well i'm on meds so i'm an exception right? Like people should in my circle, in my life, understand that I'm like this. And I have had this conversation with friends. They should understand that I feel numb. I feel flat. And, you know, every day is the same. And the result is like the fruit of fruit. I don't know if fruit's the right word, but result is everything becomes small right? And survival mode, small. Okay. And so the idea would be that what's the solution? The solution is not haphazardly just, you know, messing with the meds on my own, blah, blah, blah. I just did that back in June and that caused me some problems, right? It's looking at this, these patterns and saying, there's only really two options. If I'm not going to go down the path of, you know, getting off the meds, I got to find a way to stop obsessing about all of the what ifs that are associated with this idea. And I don't think as a man, well, men, women, not just masculine man, but especially as a man making excuses and not taking responsibility, that is not how we're going to grow or move forward. And I mean, I think that's true for men and women. That's just period. But there's a lot of victim energy in this. And there's a lot of um, like blame. You're blaming this thing and it's, it's stopping you from growing spiritually, like growing in the kingdom of God, growing in a relationship with God, growing in any kind of ministry impact. It, it hinders reaching out to people, loving other people, serious relationships, romantic relationships, possible marriage, kids, family. Um, it, for me, it gets mixed in with my sexual addiction tendencies where 
I don't feel good enough and worthy of love. So then I act out doing those things. And that's a whole cycle too. And that can come full circle back to the bipolar med thing too. And I could say, you know, well, I feel kind of numb and acting out sexually, you know, makes me feel not numb, even though it makes things worse because it's outside of God's design. There's guilt and shame attached to this, these behaviors. So then that distorts sex and any kind of future of healthy sex. So anyway, guys, I just wanted to share this. I haven't been on here very much. I am wanting to figure out, you know, what's the future of this podcast. And um, I don't think I'm ever going to fully give, give up on it, but I want to try to use my experiences to help people and not just, you know, say it without there being some kind of connection to a lesson. Like, what about this do you relate to? Do you think that the long-term effect of a, a medication, because it seems to be that um, people should use it sparingly or in uh, a short amount of time, but I don't think that that happens to everyone, right? I think we can just get in the survival mode with it. And then, no, I'm not a doctor, so don't take my advice as doctorly advice or to replace therapy. I'm just saying that, um, you know, I've had these conversations with doctors too. And it's kind of just like a doctor I had for a really long time just basically said, yeah, man, this is just part of being bipolar. Like you just, this is just part of it. You gotta, you gotta take the meds and you gotta kind of deal with these feelings. That's just the way it is. Right. And it's kind of like, Oh, I want to have hope, but if I stay in this this loop where I don't take responsibility for my my actions or say I don't need therapy because it's not really need, it's more like what is that going to do? A something that could transform me now can't. Now I'm resistant to change. And I think that uh, it's create can, can create as well self um, self absorption in in kind of a not so great way, right? Where um, you're just kind of focused on yourself all the time, and that also becomes a block to loving people and making the the changes that you need to make um, because there is something powerful about not feeling numb and flat and maybe not present with people. So let me know what you think about this episode. And if you struggle with this tension of wanting to find better ways to not just, you know, be on medication and obviously with wisdom, not just, you know, taking things into your own hands. Don't ever do that. Always use a doctor. Um, but I think it's more than just getting the doctor's permission to do something. I think it's, we have to have habits and coping skills in place to be able to, let's just say, handle the, the, the transition from being reliant on something to not being reliant, or at least making our way towards less of, of the thing. I'm not saying maybe get off of it completely, but in my opinion, from just, again, thinking about this stuff for a while and talking about it at least for a few years and saying, I've had five years of things being a struggle. It seems like um, this, this is a huge area of problem solving because I don't want to make excuses, but the truth is I am. I am assigning blame on this thing. And that's like I'm saying is a hindrance to growth. So let me know what you guys think of the episode. Uh, Jared.deal at gmail.com. I'm working on 
getting my website back up and running. But in the meantime, you can email me. You can find me on Instagram. I'll put my Instagram in the notes. I'd love to talk to you guys. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you.